odds. And sometimes you just get that place in your life where you feel, what's the use? Or you just feel like this, this is an impossible situation. Last week we started with a message out of the book of Judges. We talked about a brief little introduction to a man by the name of Shamgar and who he was and how you, God used him right where he was with what he had in his hands to make a difference when it looked like everything was over. In fact, the Philistines had surrounded the nation. Sheer doom and despair was taking place and it looked like no hope until God got on the scene, raised up somebody who comprehended the moment <clears throat> and comprehended the times that they lived in. That being Shamgar. Today, we're going to look at another story about David. Now, this is a passage. In fact, I think I've preached from this particular passage a couple of times at our church. And we'll give some introductory stuff to it, but I want to come at it from a little different angle. You know, when Shamgar's situation, as he's uh, looking at his situation, Philistines have surrounded the nation. The, the nation of Israel has no weapons. They, they have no defense. They've surrendered all their, all their military might up in hopes of peace, which was a false peace. And Shamgar was used by God to deliver the nation of Israel against all odds. Now we have a picture of a guy, <clears throat> David specifically, who's at a, a very unique point in his life of discouragement, of despair, of defeat. It looks like there's no hope for him. He knows that he's been anointed to be the king over all of Israel, but he's not. In fact, he's not even living in the land. He has since fled, run for his life because he thought everything is over. What's the use? I'm not going to make it. In fact, Shamgar stands as a picture of a man who ultimately rallies the nation to support what's going on. But David can't even rally his friends here. <clears throat> Excuse me. In fact, David has several hundred of his men with him who are now so depressed, defeated, disheartened by the situation they're in, they're ready to even kill him. So it's against all odds when not even your friends are going to stick up for you and stay with you and protect you and help you and defend you. It's a bad situation. If certainly there was an against all odds scenario, this is certainly one of those in scriptures is this man stands all alone. It's a tragic time in the life of David, but at the very same time, it was the best of times, just the worst of times. It was a good time. This is that point in David's life. I'll give you a little bit of history before we read from 1 Samuel 27. But at that time in David's life, when, remember he lives in the palace. His best friend is Jonathan, King Saul's son. He's killed Goliath. The women in the streets are applauding him. David has killed his thou, tens of thousands and Saul has killed his thousands. Saul takes that in a completely bad note. He begins to seek to kill David. Jonathan warns him. David runs for the country with his faithful troop of men and begins to hide out. From this point on, King Saul is pursuing David. Now understand the storyline is pretty simple. David loves Saul. David wants to have a fellowship and a relationship with the king. David is the next in line to be the king. But Saul's very jealous. He hates David. He's pursuing David. He's sure David wants to kill him. He's out to kill David and anything he can do to make David's life worse, that's on his agenda. Now, we said it's a tragic story because, as well as a wonderful story because on one hand, David is, you know, is, is getting ready to make a terrible decision with his life, which is going to cost him a lot. But at the same time, it's, it, he shows his character and he shows his integrity. It's, it, it's this very point where David is, is uh, hiding from Saul in the land of Israel and Saul has discovered his last hiding place and he's out to kill him. So while he sleeps in the night, the king and his men... David and his band of soldiers watch out on the cliffs below where King Saul is bedding down for the night. During the night, David had the opportunity to kill the king. But that's that passage in scripture when David said, I will not touch God's anointed. And he doesn't kill the king against some of the instruction of or the persuasion of his own men and spares his life. And but at this point, Showing this high point in David's integrity. It's this point where this passage is written in 1, Psalm, 1 Samuel where it says, And David now said in his heart, I'll now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me anymore 
in any coast of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. The passage goes on to say that David rose with his 600 men and they went to, the, to Achish, the son of Maok, Maok, the king of Gath, and David dwelt there with his men. Here's what happens. High point, low point. High point, he spares the life of king. Saul doesn't kill him. Low point, he runs. He says, what's the use? If I stay here, I'm going to die. If I go to the Philistines, I could probably die. But I, I just can't take this anymore. I just don't know how to deal with this anymore. If I stay, I, I will one day perish. Sooner or later, it's going to be over for me, and I'm just going to die, and that's going to be the end of it. Many times in our own life, we have those high and low moments. It came with Elijah when he sees the false prophets destroyed on the Mount Carmel when they call the fire down. And the next day, he's running from Jezebel who puts out the word that his life is to be destroyed. It's a bad moment in David's life because what he does, he not only just starts running, he leaves the land. He leaves his homeland. He runs away with his men and they go into the land of the Philistines. Now, let me show you how idiotic our thinking can become when we begin to run from God. Not only does he go into the land of the Philistines, which they're not buddies, by the way. Y'all got that, right? You know the story. He goes to King Achish, who is the king of the people in the Philistine territory of Gath. Now, Gath is a unique place because that's where Goliath is from. Of all the places to go and all the lands to go to, he goes to the place where he's hated the most. But that's those moments of soul insanity that come into our mind and to our life when we're not right with God. We do dumb things. We make bad decisions. We make bad choices. And somehow we think that if I make this bad choice, good things are going to happen. Let me give you a real simple formula. Bad decisions, bad results. Nothing's going to change that. You can hope, you can cry, you can wish, you can pray, you can try. Bad decisions, bad results. Mark it down. You say, well, I'm in a bad place. You probably made a bad decision. <laughs> it always happens that way. When I do dumb stuff, dumb stuff happens back. You reap what you sow. It's the law of the harvest. It's a principle set in nature by God himself. You reap what you sow. You sow to the flesh. You have the flesh. You reap destruction. But catch this picture here because I don't know about you, but I can relate to it. It's David. And he says, you know, <coughs> I'm going to perish one day. I'm just going to die. You know, there's, there's, it's a Hebrew word that simply means it's to, be, to be removed or to be scattered abroad or to be brought to ruin. There's no hope for me. My life's at an end. There's no, I guess the best thing I can do is to do the stupid thing because there's no way I'm going to get through this. There's no, I've looked at this scenario and it says, and David said in his heart, I'm just going to die. There's no hope. There's no way out. There's no better life for me. There's nothing that's going to result in this. And in fact, it just goes from bad to worse to worse and more worse and even worse. All right in his process, because when you follow him in this scenario, things just keep going down and down and down. Let me give you a little hint. If you're at the bottom, quit digging. <laughs> quit digging. It's not going to get any better. There's no gold down in there, all right? It's nothing but dirt and more dirt and more dirt and more dirt. We all get discouraged. We all have difficult times. The Bible says in this world, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. In other words, there's going to be troubles for all of us. And like David, you're not exempt from difficulty just because you're a believer. Here's a man with God has a heart like God, it says, a man after God's own heart, a man that loves God. But here he is now, he's running and he's going the wrong direction and he keeps going the wrong direction. Here's how bad it gets. He gets to the land of Gath and he meets with the king. And he starts becoming buddies with the king. And by the way, that's always a bad sign when you start buddying up with the world. You know, your friendship, you know. Uh, listen, the world doesn't get Jesus. All right. The folks at the bar, they don't get Jesus. They have their own, well, they've got their own little Jesus, but it's not the Bible Jesus. All right. Y'all know the song, me and Jesus got our own thing going. Let me tell you, no, you don't. <laughs> you get his thing going or you don't get going. 
And if you've not got his thing going, you've missed the mark. So here he is, and you can be sure that while he's sitting at fellowship with the king, he's not singing blessed assurance. He's not counting the promises of God and telling the king how great Jerusalem is in the evenings when the sun is going down. He's not talking about the sweet waters that flow at Bethel. You can be sure, because that doesn't happen, does it? When we start running from the Lord and we start becoming friends with the world and reject our fellowship with our heavenly father. We're going to love one or the other. Jesus said, if you love the world, that's enmity with God. You don't love God. You have to make your mind up. So here he is, and he's in this desperate situation in his life, and it keeps getting worse, and he keeps making more bad decisions. The king of Gath, Mr. Kish, says, hey, David, I'm going to go fight Saul. I'm going into your homeland, into your territory, and I'm going to go confront Saul and the children of Israel. And I'm not only going, I'm taking all the other kings of the Philistines with me. Every tribe of the Philistines, and we're going to invade the land, and we're going to take them down. David, this shows you how far we can get from God. I'm going with you. I'm going with you. I'm going to go fight. The one who sa I said I wouldn't touch God's anointed, I'm going to. I'm not going to touch him. I'm going to touch him real hard. <laughs> and not only that, I'm going to go fight with you. I'm going to fight against my brothers and my sisters and my kinsmen, and I'm going to fight against my own nation. That's how bad it gets. Don't think you can't get there. Because what happens, the more we start resisting God's will and rejecting God's will, the worse and worse we get and our thinking gets perverted. It gets warped. And we start running from the very thing that God has for us. We start running towards hell like it was heaven and making worse decisions and worse decisions. It, gets, it doesn't get any better. And this is where David is. I, I, you know, I, what's the use? And so he just starts following along. It, it doesn't get any better. Let me go on with the story, okay? Because when you follow the story through, he gets his 600 men, they get on the horses, they head up to the battle lines together with all the kings of the Philistines and he pulls up with his group and the other king says to Mr. Kish, King Kish, are you out of your mind? That's David. You're riding with David. Have you lost your mind? Don't you know who that is? And they go on and say, we need to have a talk. And they take him aside, the king, and they said, he's not going to battle with us. He's not going to go to war with us because as soon as we get in the battle and as soon as we start the war and the blood starts flowing, David's going to see what's going on, that this is his kinsman and it's his nation and it's his country. We know David from a little boy we've seen him fight and he's going to turn on us and kill us all. They were scared of him. By the way, little side note here, the world doesn't get you if you're going to be a believer. They'll do everything they can to try to bring you back to them. But once you get there, they don't like you still. <laughs> Even though you try to be like them, act like them, smell like them, do what they do, they don't like you still. Why? Because by nature, you're a child of light. By nature, you're a child of God. And the very spirit of God that lives in you, their spirit is repulsed by your spirit. They may say and try to think, I really like him, I like him, but what? there's something different. You know? And they'll reject you. And they always reject you. You can't put that proverbial round peg in the square hole. It's not going to fit. So why try to go back there? It's, a, it's the insanity of our sin, isn't it? It keeps appealing to us to come back, to come back. And so they have their little business meeting. And then they, the king of Akish comes back and says, I'm sorry, David. You can't go to war with us. Well, I can almost see David and his 600 men, their heads dropping. Can it get anywhere? I've been, I'm, now I'm rejected by my enemies who I have to want to take sides with. It just gets worse and worse. And now I, you can almost see 600 men. They've been camping at a little place called Ziklag. All right. He gets his 600 men. They get up on their horses and they're headed back to Ziklag. I bet there's not any conversation. You know, nobody's singing how great they are. All right. It's quiet. And they're going back to Ziklag. And as they approach what they see and what they smell is not life and dancing and rejoicing that the husbands are home. There's nothing but death and despair. As they cross the plain and they approach Ziklag where they were in camp, there's nothing but smoke coming up. And it's not the smoke of campfires or welcome fires. It's the smell of rebellion. It's the smell of defeat. It's the smell of discouragement. It's the smell of death. When they get there, they discover everything's either been burnt or carried off. 
Because the Amalekites had come. My David's going to go off to battle. The Amalekites from the south had come in and raided him. And by the way, you reap what you sow. Because what David had been doing since he came into the Philistine land, you need resources to, fill, to feed 600 men and their families to take care of the livestock. They've been going down and raiding the Amalekites in the meantime. And so when the Amalekites discover that David's gone off, they come up and get what was theirs and everything else. And they carry off the wives and the children, the precious, valuable things, your children, your family. Isn't it amazing? Satan's never satisfied. You think if you just take sides with him, he's going to leave you alone. Just, you know, okay, okay, you win. I'm defeated. I'm discouraged. I can't tell. I know I'm a mess. And man, I, I'm supposed to love God. I don't love God. And here I am. And I just, get, just leave me alone. It's kind of like peace at any price. But there is no peace. There's no peace. You run from God. You reject God. You reject his word. There's no victory there. There's no smell of sweet victory that comes from those flowers. It's just death and weeds and despair. That's all your life is going to produce as long, if you're a child of God, as long as you run from God. And here's David. Think it can't get any worse. I see him slipping off his horse. And he looks back and all those 600 men who were the most loyal men scripture ever mentions. You want to do a great study in the word of God, go back and read about David's mighty men. These guys risk everything for him. He just wanted to, he was talking one night around the campfire about how sweet the water from Bethel would be. They risk life and limb to go get him a drink of water. I mean, these were guys, they, they fought. They were spectacular warriors. They were men's men. And now they've lost everything because of following David's bad decisions. And it says, and David's men spoke in this passage of stoning him. Rejection at the ultimate level. The best of your best friends. Well, you follow the story through, you see that there's heartbreak and there's heartache and there's discouragement over these results of terrible decisions. Man, I know that when I've made bad decisions, it always brings these kind of things in our life. And you know as well as I, Satan never lets up. He's not sat just because you backslid, he's not happy with that. He wants you miserable. It's like one friend of mine told me, he says, when I lost everything, including my family, and my face is down in the dirt, he said, Satan is there just kicking more dirt in my face. That's the way it works. Don't ever think that that peace at any price is good. It's not. Because there is no peace without Jesus. The Bible says, from the words of his own lips, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives peace. He talks about a peace that passes all understanding, a peace from God and a peace with God. Listen, you can't get that in the world. You can't get it from money. You can't get it from friendship. You can't get it in marriage, that kind of peace. You can't get that kind of, mar that, that, that kind of peace in money. You can't get it in drugs. You can't get it out of a bottle. Nothing satisfies like a refreshing fellowship and walk with Jesus in your life. The rest is just counterfeit and miserable. David got discouraged and what did he do? The worst thing we can do when we get discouraged is to take matters into our own hands and make bad decisions after bad decisions after bad decision. He retreats to get the pressure off and what happens? Things only get worse. And there he is. Now, when I preached this message before, I had three points that I, that I brought out. I said they were like this. David lost three things. He lost his vision, he lost his passion, and he lost his purpose. When he lost, it means he lost his vision. He lost the visions of the promises of God. All those Psalms and all those passages in scripture where David is just talking about the grace of God and how God's his strength and how God is his tower and God's his refuge and his fortress and his stronghold, how he's his protection and how he's always near. And he's like the shepherd God is who leads him beside still waters, who meets his needs, even in the presence of his enemies. He brings grace and sustenance and sufficiency. David now has said in his heart, I'm just, I'm just gonna die. He doesn't see that anymore, does he? But not only lose his vision, he lost his passion. Passion is that, that hunger of heart. We talked about zeal when I preached this message the first time. 
It, it, there's a zeal that, that comes into the life of a believer when we really get our hearts right with God that just drives us. We want to, we want to love Jesus. We want to be obedient. It's, it's that hunger for God. And it's, it's manifest in a, in a life of commitment to God. And I think and when I shared with our staff this week at our staff retreat, I said, one of the ways that we show that we're most dependent upon God, really dependent upon God, is not by saying it and not by telling others, it's by prayer. Prayer shows if I really do believe God is my all-sufficient God. If I'm not praying, I'm obviously not trusting. You have not because you ask not. It's pretty clear, isn't it, in Scripture? So Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. At the same time, he said, ask of me, and I will, I will give to you. If you, need, if you need the Spirit, if you need grace, just ask me. The Father's not going to give a son a stone if he asks him for a piece of bread. He said, your father's a good father. What do you need? The sufficiency of life, the joy of life, the strength for living. It all comes from God. But when you lose that prayer commitment and you lose the, that dependency upon the father, that certainly bursts that last part. You lose purpose in life. I gave a simple definition in that message that purpose is just the outward liberation of passion and vision. If we have vision, if we have passion, then there's going to be purpose to our life. When we lose that sense of purpose, it's usually because we quit looking and having eyes to see. It's usually because we've lost that, that hunger that drives us to God to depend upon God. But there's another element to this message that, that I just don't want you to miss because we can talk about what we lost and how we lose our divine purpose and we lose our passion and vision. But what I want to talk to you about today goes beyond that. It talks about restoration and recovery to restore. And if you look at David's life, you can follow those steps of action that he took in the wrong direction. He gets discouraged. He takes things into his own hand. He moves and makes a bad decision and goes to the wrong place and to the wrong people. Those people don't receive him because he's a man of God. They reject him. Even though he's a backslidden man of God, he's still in his heart a man of God. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. If you're saved, you're saved. All right? And you try to be a saved person in darkness, you're just going to be more miserable. You're going to be more miserable than you've ever been in your life. Mark it down. And so I think the important part of this story today is to catch what David does in coming back to a place where God speaks to his heart again and he gets vision and he comes back to that place of passion and he comes back to that place of purpose in his life. Because I want you to know every one of us has the potential to drift and to wander. And what Satan will do, especially if you're a new believer, he loves to pull this one, big guns, as fast as he can on you, all right? He comes in with the big guns and says, oh, I see what you've done, but you didn't mean business, so that's not it. And he tries to introduce everything, every doubt, every imagination into your heart to get you to stray. Because if he can't keep you from being saved, he'll do everything he can to keep you from having an effective life and a purposeful life and a significant life. He wants you to live like a little old lump of coal in the corner. But no purpose and no meaning, just passing by. I'm sitting here on the world. As the world goes by, Earth rotating on its axis while I'm sitting on mine behind. <laughs> and that's it. Miserable. Getting by one day at a time. When Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and you might have that life more abundantly. That's more than a Sunday school memory verse. That's the fullness of your life he's talking about. Having significant purposeful life that means something. Most people don't know that. Life means something because most people don't know Christ. But here's what he does. Catch this. First thing he does, the most important thing, he prays. He said, and David's men spoke with stoning him and David prayed. Listen, when people start talking about killing you, prayer is a good thing. <laughs> Might be time to pray. Might be time to spend some time with God. But this is, this is where the church, if they're deficient in anything in the church, in America at least today, it's within this area of spending time with God. We're too busy. We got too much to do. We got too much to accomplish. I got too many, and even for God, we got too much to do for God, but we don't pray. We forget that Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And therefore, to prove, you know, that he's true, we go off and we try to do something, but it's always nothing. 
We can't do anything until we've prayed. We can't accomplish anything until we've prayed. We're not going to succeed until we've prayed. We're not going to win others until we've prayed. We're not going to have revival until we've prayed. We're not going to be the kind of man or the kind of woman God calls you to be until you've prayed. Because it's in prayer that I get a hold of the heart of God. It's in prayer that I come to God. It's in prayer that God and I are being what he called and saved me to be, one. I'm speaking, I'm hearing, I'm listening. I told our staff at our retreat, I said, but you know, as a pastor, I realize that there's very few people who really know how to pray anymore. I just don't know how to pray. Here's our prayer. Lord, we love you today and we thank you that we can be here in your church today and ask you to bless us and bless me and bless the service and bless the pastor and, and keep the devil away. In Jesus' name, amen. That's not warfare. That's not supplication. And that ain't intercession. Doesn't meet any of the qualifications of real prayer. That's just a selfish little person wanting to get something as quick and as easy and as fast as they can from God without having to commit any time or sacrifice any of themselves. I thought you said amen. It was a little weak. <laughs> so we pray. You don't think David's over there saying, oh God, these guys are mad. You better do something quick. I need a blessing. Bless me. He's over there, and I believe in this process of praying, he's pouring out his heart to God. God, I've messed up. God, I made stupid decisions. And not only, I, made, I led these guys who trusted me, who are my friends. And now I've not only lost everything, they've lost everything. I think that prayer is that prayer of repentance and it's that prayer of supplication, you know, or, or of brokenness, you know. Jesus said, come unto me all that are weary, all you that are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I believe that's where David's coming, to find that shepherd's rest again. He leads me like a, like a sheep. He leads me beside still waters, and besides the green pastures. He's, God, I'm, I'm just, I made some really sheepish, stupid decisions. Y'all do know sheep aren't the smartest animal in the forest, right? By the way, let me say this about prayer. It's not worrying on your knees. Some people just get down and they just worry on their knees. This is finding the Word of God and finding what God says in His Word about your life and about His will. If we pray anything, we, talk, we pray according to the will of God. In October, we're starting a whole new series. It'll be built around our lift groups as well. So get in lift group during this period of time. You really want to know what prayer is all about? We're going to spend about 10 weeks talking about prayer and what it really means. We're following up with studies within our lift group. Prayer, and there's another aspect of this, and I, called, I just called it prepare, is what I put down here. And I, I believe that means to, uh, just repenting, cleaning up your heart. You know, one of Satan's favorite methods in the midst of your discouragement is condemnation. It goes something like this. You just did something really bad. You, made, you sinned. You chose against God. You knew what you're supposed to do. You didn't do it. Or you didn't do what you're supposed to do. You just know, right? You're there. You're in a mess. And Satan comes and says, boy, you really are stupid. That's about the dumbest thing I've ever seen anybody do. You talk about really stupid. Are you really a Christian? Because if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't have done that. I mean, Christians don't do that. I mean, I, I, I don't think you're a Christian. You think you're a Christian? I don't think you think you're a Christian either, do you? I mean, what's the use? I mean, you, you blew this so bad, don't even go. I wouldn't even go back and look people in the face. I just go somewhere else, go away, go hide somewhere because you're not worth it and you're a miserable wreck and it's, you're never going to amount to anything, so just. You know, ain't getting no getting over it, so just go run and go kill yourself. That's the way he works. That's his MO. That's his, that's his favorite, favorite thing is, is lies and, and, and desperation lies. And, it, and what people do is they, they just, can, they, they believe it. The Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. And so he makes the accusation. And one thing about condemnation, it keeps us if we don't learn how to resolve it and deal with it in prayer and, and, and in faith and repentance before the Lord, then it keeps us in bondage and it keeps us in captivity. It, it creates within us this, 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 this little atmosphere that we don't make good decisions in. It's like David, after he sinned with Bathsheba, he never correctly dealt with his son Absalom after that because of his guilt, I believe. He was guilty over it. And because his guilt kept driving him to make stupid decisions in regard to his own son. He just kept paying the price. That's what condemnation does for us. So what do we do? We learn to take everything to the Lord and lay it all to the cross and say, Jesus, man, I made some dumb decisions here. I made some bad mistakes here. I need you. I can't do this without you. You told me that I didn't listen. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Wash me with the blood of Jesus. 
I know that everything Satan telling me about me is true, but you've made me a new person. And I want to live from that life, not that old life. I, by my flesh, I am a failure, but I'm in you now. That's that, that, you have to deal with the condemnation and those convictions the right way. Mo, you know what most Baptists will do when they get under conviction? They just go try harder. Instead of just getting honest with God, God, I've messed up. Because we don't want to admit our failures. We don't come to the place of repentance. So we just kind of double our efforts. Prepare your heart by getting it right with God, dealing with the issues of condemnation. The third element is this, believe God. There's some point in time, you're going to have to stand up and say, I trust God. So Joe, I tried and I failed. You're going to have to get up and trust God this time. You, you probably stood up the first time and said, watch what I can do for you. you you're, you know, you're pretty blessed to have me in the kingdom is our mindset. You know, like God needed you. You know, like we talked about that bumper, stash, la, bumper sticker last week. That, you know, you need God and God needs you. God don't need you. You, you need God, though. There's half truth there. You do need God. All right? God can do what he needs through Balaam's ass. All right? So let's get it in proper perspective here. You need God. I need God. We need God. And so we have to stand and say, I'm going to trust you, God. I don't even know how, but I are. I don't know exactly what you want, but I'm going to believe you. And by doing that, what's the Bible say? We overcome the fiery darts of the wicked one with the shield of what? Faith. So you hold up that faith shield. Well, how do you do that? Well, when Satan comes in and says, well, you know, the Lord's left you arms. You're no good. It's not going to work out for you. You, re you refute that and you rebuke that by standing on faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And the word of God says, no, I will never leave thee, nor will I ever forsake thee. So that when the condemnation, when the fiery dart comes, when the accusation comes, you hold up the word of God. He said he'd never leave me and forsake, never forsake me. When he comes in and says, you know, there's just, you know, there's no good's going to come out of this. You guys would just accept your defeat. It's all over. You're washed up. You've made too many mistakes. It's no good. Nothing ever going to good come for you. Well, the Bible says come something different. So I take the word of God, hold up my shield of faith. My shield of faith says something completely different. It says he will never leave me, but also says all things work together for good to them that love God. In other words, God will take my miserable, wretched failure and redeem me in it. And although there may be prices to pay that are affected by it, I want you to know God will even take the worst of the worst and do something supernatural in my life as a result of it. It may, I don't know what it is. I don't know how it works. I just know that the Bible is true and that God says all things work. To, it didn't say all things were good, did it? But God is so committed to you that he even take your failures and use them for his glory in your life. That's not an excuse to go, well, I'll give God lots of opportunity then. No. You're in trouble if that's the way you approach it. It's like saying, you know, well, God forgives all my sins. So I'm just going to go sin. You don't get it. You don't understand the glory of God. But the shield of faith says, you know, well, Brother Joe, you don't understand the church hurt me or people hurt me or my feelings have been hurt. They disappointed me. Hey, God won't disappoint you. You know, your battle's not with people. The shield of faith, when it's lifted, says, my fight is not with flesh and blood. My fight is with principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in high place. So if I'm getting upset with somebody, I'm getting upset with the wrong thing and the wrong person. I need to get upset with the devil for letting him manipulate my life for those kind of things. And we hold up the shield of faith. Now what David does, I believe he comes to this place and if you read the passage, it says, and David sought the Lord and he asked the Lord, shall I recover? And the Lord says, go recover all. How are you going to do that? Well, this is the best part of this whole passage, I think, in, in point number four, when David said, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Have you ever done that? Just take time to, just you and Jesus, all right? Now, it's not going off the side and having a little seat in the chair and saying, all right, I need to spend some time with God, and I'm going to get over here with God. I'm going to have a little seat with God, and I'm going to encourage myself. Go get him, Joe. You can do it. Get up, 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 do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, be strong, be strong. There may be some element of that, but that's not what we're saying here. What we are saying here is that I do sit down with God and I say, God, you are my strength. I need strength and you're it. You are my hope. I need hope. I got no hope, but you're my hope, so you're it. 
God, you're my, the, the word when it says encouraged himself, it's the word means he made himself strong in the Lord. He reaffirmed himself in the Lord. He recommitted himself to the Lord. That's what it's all talking about here. So it's that point said, get up and worship God and praise God and believe God. David had to do it for himself at this point. Why? Because nobody else is doing it. It's kind of not in words of encouragement that his 600 men are giving him. You want to hang him or kill him with stones? <laughs> David encouraged himself, Lord. And there will be times like that in your life. You're going to walk down some dark roads at different times in your life, and nobody's going to be there to hold your hand. Nobody. And Satan will take full advantage of you in those situations if you do not know how to stand strong in the Lord. He'll manipulate you. He'll deceive you. He'll defeat you. You'll live in despair. You'll live in abject depression. Do you come to this little simple secret? I will bless the Lord at all times. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. My voice will confirm the word of God. I'll take my joy in Jesus. I'll lift up the Lord Jesus. I'll preach, sing Jesus, preach Jesus, talk Jesus. I'll trust you. Stand strong. The fifth element of this is, is pursue. Verse 8 of that passage says, And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered and said, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and without fail you will recover everything. I know I've mentioned this before, but just as a quick side note. Discouragement usually comes at two unique times in our life. One, just after something really powerful and good and wonderful has happened. You ever notice that? Sometimes it's there because we have so mentally and emotionally and spiritually drained ourselves in those moments that we're just kind of like an empty cup waiting to be filled with something. We've got to be careful. Take Elijah on Mount Carmel, for instance. The fire falls. He kills all those false prophets. He runs, outruns King Ahab back to the city in the rain. Different is, Ahab ain't running. He's riding in chariots drawn by horses. Elijah blows right by him. He's excited. Revivals come. Things are happening. Good times are here. Praise the Lord. And then, boom, slats are knocked right out from under him. Jezebel puts out a word. You're going to be dead by this time tomorrow. And he runs. But also sometimes we need to realize that just after something and just before something, you know, it's both ways. With Elijah's afterwards, sometimes, well, what's the old saying? It's biblical. It's always darkest before the, before the dawn. The dawn awaits us. And some of you may be in the dark of night right now in your life, but you cannot lose hope. You cannot enter into the realm and to that, that shadows of despair and depression and discouragement and defeat. You have got to get up and pursue the things that God has called you to pursue. You've got to get up and be faithful. You've got to get up and continue to love God. You've got to continue to hold on to Him. Everything, everything that you'll receive from the Lord Jesus Christ in your life is going to be as a result of you trusting Him and your faith. That's why the Bible says, well, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We have to walk by faith. We have to move by faith. We live our lives by faith. David moved forward. And the Bible says, and David, what does it say in, in verse 30? And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. There was nothing lacking in them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters nor spoil nor anything that they had taken them. David recovered all. God said, pursue, recover all. Several times in the next verses that David recovered all. And David recovered all. And David recovered all. You get the note? You get the message? All right. What did David do? He got it all back. God is the God of restoration. I love that passage. What God will restore what the locust has eaten. He'll recover. He'll restore. But you have to trust him. It's not going to happen while you're sitting on the back row of your spiritual life, just kind of putting along and blaming everybody in the world for the difficulty that you're facing in your spiritual life, discouraged and defeated. Get out of that mode. Shake that off. Get on your face before God and pray and seek his face. Be sure that you pursue. Don't get caught standing around and see what God has for you. Folks, we serve a mighty God. You read Romans 8 when you get home. You don't believe God's mighty. Just take time to read. Sit down and read Romans chapter 8. In fact, what David thought was the worst thing that could happen in his life, and certainly was up to that point, ultimately becomes the very greatest thing 
And not too much after this in scripture do you see David being catapulted to the throne of the king of Israel. Hallelujah. That's the grace of God. We accomplish things for God, but not without faith and not without prayer and not without pursuit. It has to happen. You know, you don't have to read far in this to discover the grace of God. But you also need to see in between the lines here. If you live in discouragement, boy, it's just going to lead from one thing to another. From discouragement to defeat, even to depression. We're living in a culture that seems to be just captured by that. And they're doing everything they can, but it's all the wrong things. They think it's going to be found in party life. They think it's going to be found in relationships. They think it's going to be found in jobs and careers and security. Listen, life comes from God. And if you reject God, you might as well just hang it up. You've rejected life. You can't live like God never intended for any man or any woman to live their life apart from him. If that's the way you're living your life, you got it wrong. And it's time, praise God, for the grace of God to get it right. And you can do by the very thing David did, get before God, get your heart right with God. Let's stand with our heads bowed.